Hello, and welcome to Behind the Horror. Scary movie fans such as myself will hear that a movie is based on a true story. A few of them we know, but most we never go on to find out just what that true story is. So in this series, we will explore and find out exactly what the true story is behind the movies we love. And a side note, I am making this podcast into a video, so if you would like to see the footage of this place, then go to my Patreon and check it out. The 2009 movie, Albino Farm, starts us out with a couple of boys riding their bikes through the square of a very small town called Shiloh, and it appears to be in the 1950s. The boys ride down a road that cuts through the woods near what the locals call the Albino Farm. They stop in front of the gates, locked up tight with a chain, a quote, condemned sign on the iron bars. The oldest boy squeezes himself through the gate and walks down the overgrown path. He is then snatched up by an unseen figure, just as the smaller boy is also taken. It then fast forwards to the present. A group of young adults are driving through the Ozark Mountains, located in a very rural part of the Midwest. They nearly crash as they see a person in the middle of the road using a spatula to get roadkill up off of the pavement. This causes them, of course, to get a flat tire, thus stranding them on a back road in the middle of nowhere with no cell phone service. One of the men sees a sign that says, quote, gas two miles. So, they decide to drive slowly on the flat tire to get to the gas station. Now, once they get there, an older blind man is sitting in a rocking chair, and he begins speaking about how the past should stay in the past, speaking of the local legends and how people come to investigate it and are giving the town Shiloh a bad name. He also throws in some Bible scripture and grabs their attention, leading them to begin to want to explore the area. They change out their flat tire and they begin driving down a gravel back road and they stumble upon a Christian revival tent. They stop, they approach the tent and begin speaking with a local who tells them about the local legend of the albino farm people with quote damned souls he then tells them that it's just a story that the old people tell the young people to scare them and that there isn't anything out in those woods the group finds their way into the small town of shiloh that seems to be all but deserted the sun is beginning to set they decide to stop in town to eat at a local small cafe where they notice that the waitress has a deformed hand. They are also being watched by some men in a black car sitting outside. They go out and two of them speak to the men in the car, one of the men in the car being Chris Jericho, you know, the wrestler and now singer, and the boys offer to take them to the albino farm. They drive for a while through what looks like a field They finally get to the gate where they are warned by Jericho's character about how the place is evil. They walk through the woods and come up to an old abandoned house. Now the other two from the group go into the local church and speak with a lady within. When they ask her about the albino farm, the lady becomes visibly upset denying its existence and she storms off through a door. Not long after, the pair walk through the door where the old lady had went through and they see her breastfeeding what appears to be a deformed baby. They run out, deciding to go find their friends and get out of that town. What happens next? Well, for the maybe handful of you that have seen it, no. And for the majority of you, well, you probably won't see it, and I don't blame you. 
It is a great movie actually in the making. The theme is good and the acting not too bad. But you can tell it was an ultra low budget film and a lot of people make fun of it. But the legend of the albino farm is a very real thing. So let me set the scene. The place that the albino farm legend is from is nestled in the middle of what is known as the Ozark Mountains. This area is mainly in northern Arkansas and runs north to about halfway through Missouri. A bit of it does touch in Oklahoma as well. And I know this area well because I am from the Ozark Mountains. It is absolutely beautiful with huge rolling hills carpeted with vast forests and gorgeous waterways and caves. So what is known as the albino farm itself is located on the northern side of a fairly big city, Springfield, Missouri, just as you are getting out of the city. Fun fact, Springfield is where Brad Pitt is from. So when he does his quirky little Southern accent, he's not actually acting. He's just using his quote, hometown voice, but I digress. The movie portrays the locals of this area as dumb, inbred hillbillies, and that couldn't be further from the truth. But the intense religion is no joke. Do a Google image search of the Ozark Mountains. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. Now, nearly everyone from anywhere near that area has heard of the albino farm. And there are actually a few different accounts of this legend. People say it was from different times, from the Civil War ages up to the turn of the century, but they all agree on one thing. A long time ago, a large farm existed just north of Springfield. Where the legend varies is that the caretaker of that farm was a person who was albino. Side note, I'm using the word albino as that term is used by the locals for generations. I don't mean any disrespect. So another branch of the legend is that, you know, horrible scientific experiments were carried out on the farm against albinos or that an albino family lived there. The story I heard growing up was that it was a place that people who had albinism were welcome to come or encouraged to go to, that it was a remote and private place to escape the public ridicule of looking, quote, different. But then once they arrived, they were forced into slavery. I remember the stories people would tell of how these people would sometimes escape and the owner of the farm would use a lantern and walk the old road out front looking for his property and that his ghost could still be seen doing that very thing. Local teens and young adults knew where the old property was and even I, during a trip to that area, rode with someone who showed me where the farm was. And you did have to walk through a wooded area, but no way was I getting out of that car. It was dark and just, no. But I was told stories of people hearing voices out in those woods or running due to hearing footsteps chasing them when no one was there. So first, let's talk about what albinism is for those that might not be familiar. According to ScienceDaily.com, albinism is a lack of pigmentation in the eyes, skin, and or hair. It is an inherited condition which results from the combination of recessive genes passed from both parents. This condition is seen throughout animals in the wild as well. The gene which results in albinism actually prevents the body from making the normal amount of melanin, which, you know, is the pigment that gives our skin, our eyes, and our hair its color. The statistics are that about 1 in 17,000 people have some form of albinism, but up to 1 in 75 are carriers. 
It is one of the best known out of a group of rare genetic disorders that affect the eyes and the skin. It is observed much less often out in nature because the living creature cannot blend in with its surroundings, making its likelihood of survival dramatically reduced. Wildlife, just as humans with albinism, can have no pigment in their irises, making their eyes appear red or pink. However, it's just the blood vessels in the retina being visible. Most living creatures who have albinism appear to have pink eyes and extremely pale skin and nearly pure white hair, but this can also vary a bit. In my opinion, it is one of the more beautiful genetic differences we can have, but there are of course stereotypes and even superstitions about this condition. It has been said that people with albinism are cursed or their families are being punished by their long dead ancestors. Some have believed that their body parts can be used to make magic or that their very blood holds magical properties. Some say they aren't as intelligent as the average human, which is of course impossible, or they are completely sterile, all of this being ridiculous. Now, the property where the legend takes place when I was in my late teens was still untouched by civilization. You turned north at a cemetery and it wasn't but a, maybe a couple of miles up the way. Last I heard, the city was creeping ever northward and suburbia was getting close. Take the time and look up the albino farm in Springfield, Missouri on YouTube. Several people have taken cameras out there and filmed the grounds. It is really, really interesting. And of course, like I said, this podcast will have an accompanying video. So getting into the story, it all starts with the Sheedy family. Mike Sheedy was an Irish Catholic immigrant who moved to the United States when he was only 15 years old. He started his life here in Ohio. Then he moved to Louisiana. He lived in St. Louis, Missouri for a while, but eventually moved southwest to the Springfield area in 1872 and bought the infamous farm around 1920 for $30,000 for 338 acres. And see, that was an unheard of amount of money for those times. Back then, it was a glorious piece of property with large barns for horses. It boasted pure Jersey cows and it had one large mansion and then a few smaller houses. In fact, back in the 1890s, the public were welcome to come out to the farm to race horses or just ride and have a good time. And prior to that, it was still a working farm long before the Civil War. On February 3rd, 1911, the Springfield Republican noted that Springlong Farms, quote, environment for handling livestock is ideal, situated as it is in the heart of a section of pure bluegrass county that is surpassed by none other in the world. Many of these acres have never been plowed and are covered by a thick, tough, velvety sod so dear to the eye of the stockman." Unquote. So Mike Sheedy met and married Mary Gorman in July of 1873. Mike was employed at the St. Louis and San Francisco Railroad Company, helping build the old railroad that was to run from St. Louis down to Springfield nearly in the southwest corner of the state. They started their life in the area not far from the farm, but worked hard and saved their money and began buying acreage. And not just acreage for that farm, but other places as well. Then in 1923, they started work on the sprawling estate, formerly owned by the Headley family, but they didn't move in until they had completed some major renovations and upgrades, at least for those times. While Mike was still a young man, he had managed to buy several areas full of acreage and was considered 
one of the most successful self-made men in that area. He later went on to serve on the school board for 20 years and was a road commissioner for 20 years as well. Mike and Mary had had nine children, Emmett, Simon, Mike, James, Margaret, Helen, Agnes, John, and Kate. Though John and Kate by this point had married and moved on. Now interestingly, none of their children went on to have any children of their own, save one, Kate. Her children would be the nieces and nephews that will come into play in the story soon enough. Only two of the boys ever got married. That leaves six that never married, never had children, and never moved away from that farm. So this farm, as I said, known as Springlong Farm or the Albino Farm, is simply just that, a farm. Mike had several hundred head of cattle for beef and dairy. He kept pigs and also grew wheat. The family were very financially well off, but they worked hard for their prosperity. But mo money, mo problems, as they say, and that money came with tragedy. It has been reported that one of the sons committed suicide on that property. The patriarch, Mike Sheedy, died in April 1934. There were some kind of family fighting and the wills had to be meticulously rewritten, each possession and bit of land redistributed. Now Kate, the one daughter that did get married and have children, was all but written out, but it is not known why. And as each family member aged and died, the farm became harder and harder to keep up. In the end, Agnes, Margaret, and Helen were the last three living children. Now these three older women were considered spinsters, never having been married, nor had they ever lived anywhere but in that house. So, as the story goes, they decided to hire a man to help them. This is where the legend of the albino farm got its roots. Sources say that they hired a man to help them that had albinism. He also seemed to have a rather bad temper and would chase off individuals who came too close to the property with a shotgun. Of course, I'm sure he had to be aware that the usual reason for the visitors was because they wanted to get a good look at him. It has been revealed that there were charges made against the estate, including hiring 24-7 security for the 330-acre farm for the week surrounding Halloween night, which would have been mind-blowingly expensive. But these women were terrified of the people that were beginning to walk around in what was once their paradise. And then there was one. Helen Sheedy was the last remaining child living on the property. The farm and the land were finally auctioned off in 1979 after Helen had passed away that January and the house remained vacant. The once beautiful mansion and sprawling estate was in obvious, severe decline. The locals said it had begun about 15 years earlier, around 1964, when the last son of Mike and Mary died. Other land that the family had owned had been periodically sold, which did guarantee the family fortune. In 1980, An arsonist set fire to the old mansion, burning the roof off completely and causing severe damage to the inside of the house. The fire set to the barn burned it completely to the ground. Just days after, the house was burned down completely as well. One of the heirs to the property, a distant nephew to the original family, a direct descendant of Kate's, said that it would cost too much to rebuild that mansion and the property overall. He also said vandals had already begun to break windows and tear up the old fireplaces after the auction. 
There have been drug parties on the property and now it is rumored to be haunted. If you ask any of the relatives of the original family what happened, what's the family history, the dynamics and relationships, they just will not discuss it because of the horrible rumors that were started about that beautiful land. So basically, from an absolutely glorious and beautiful working farm predating the Civil War to today, some stone and outlines of once were buildings and barns are all that's left. It is thick and overgrown with trees and brush. There is trash and a small fire pit someone has built and abandoned. Someone spray painted one of the old silos, leaving a message that says, quote, evil awaits. Another message simply says, run. Now, a company owns the property whose owner is extremely reluctant to let anyone near or even on the property, and on the rare occasion that he does, he does not want its exact location given out or pictures to be taken. Of course, people still get on the property. And for now, there are no immediate plans to develop the property. And what of the albino caretaker? Did he truly exist? And if so, whatever happened to him? My sources didn't say. But most times, an urban legend does spark from a small, thin thread of truth. But we do know that there were actually no scientific experiments being performed on people who were born with albinism on that farm. There was no large family of albinos occupying the farm. It was once, in its glory days, a huge homestead boasting hundreds and hundreds of acres before the Civil War, and it was the largest of its kind in that area. The estate was so open and inviting, where outsiders were welcome to come ride horses, see the grazing cattle. There was even a small play area for children. And then, Within just a few generations, it became a place of local folklore, spooky and deserted. Fires burning down the great mansion. It now lays in ruins with another generation's worth of trees and brush growth around it, as Mother Nature always reclaims what humans abandon. Thanks for listening. Music by Kevin MacLeod on Incompetech.com.